Φερμά το Τεχνολογικό Ιδρύμα Νόηση, το προσωπικό του, ε, το οποίο μα βοήθησε να γίνει αυτή η ομιλία, ε, με κάθε μέσο που διαθέτανε, και ιδιαίτερα το πρόεδρο του Νόηση, πρόεδρο του Διοικητικού Συμβουλίου, τον Νόηση, κ. Βαρβούλη. Ευχαριστούμε που ήρθατε εδώ και ελπίζουμε ότι μετά από αυτή την ομιλία πολλοί θα σκεφτούν λίγο διαφορετικά το τι μπορεί να μας δώσει ελεύθερο λογισμικό και πώς μπορεί να προχωρήσει την Ελλάδα. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Παρακαλώ τον κύριο Σόλου Μασοπίδη να προσέλθει για να μας πει δύο λόγια για την Ένωση Ελλήνων Χριστών Ελεύθερου Λογισμικού. Ο κύριο Αβίτη είναι μέλο του Συλλόγου τη Μη Κυβερνητική Οργάνωση Ένωση Ελληνικών Χρηστών Ελεύθερου Λογισμού. Να σα καλησπέρισω και εγώ με τη σειρά μου και να σα καλωσορίσω στην ομιλία μα. Γνωρίζω πω αρκετοί ανάμεσά μα έχουν ταξιδέψει αρκετά χιλιόμετρα για να παραβρεθούν απόψε μαζί μα. Και αυτό με χαροποιεί αρκετά. Ε, Όπω σα είπε και ο φίλο Κώστα, ονομάζομαι Σαββίδη Όλων και είμαι μέλο του συλλόγου μα. Ε, και θα σα παρουσιάσω μια σύντομη αναφορά στο έργο και την ιστορία του συλλόγου μα. Ε, πριν ξεκινήσω, όμω, θα ήθελα να σα πω πω ε, στα χαρτιά που κρατάτε στα χέρια σα και στι αφήσει μα ε, γράφει το ότι προηγούμενη ονομασία μας, Greek Loop, η οποία, η οποία πλέον έχει αλλάξει και είναι η gnugia.org, το οποίο θα ήθελα να το διορθώσετε. Ε, ξεκινώντας, όλα ξεκίνησαν από μια μικρή παρέα ανθρώπων, οι οποίοι είχαν κοινά οράματα και ανησυχίες πάνω στο ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Η πρώτη φορά που ήρθα σε επαφή μαζί τους ε, ήταν σαν τους γνωρίζω χρόνια. Σημάδι πολύ σημαντικό που μου έδωσε ιδιαίτερη χαρά ε, περιμένοντας από το τι θα έρθει μελλοντικά. Κάθε φορά που βρισκόμουν μαζί τους ε, παρατηρούσα με μεγάλη μου χαρά πως η παρέα αυτή μεγάλη και εμπλουσιτινιζόταν με ανθρώπους κάθε φορά. Άνθρωποι με κοινές φιλοδοξίες, με τα ίδια οράματα και την ίδια αγάπη για το ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Ο καιρός πέρασε, η ομάδα μεγάλωσε, η παρέα έγινε πιο δυνατή 
και ήρθε η στιγμή που έπρεπε κάπου να στεγάσουμε όλες τις φιλοδοξίες μας και τα όνειρά μας και έτσι έγινε η πειτακτική ανάγκη να δημιουργηθεί ο Σύλλογος. Χωρίς να φοβηθούμε πολλά πράγματα και τα τείχη που είχαν ψωθεί μπροστά μας, όπως οικονομικά, είτε οργανωτικά, είτε κάποιοι άνθρωποι οι οποίοι μας είχαν προειδοποιήσει ότι ο δρόμος για έναν σύλλογο είναι πολύ δύσκολο. Τα παραμερίσαμε όλα αυτά, δεν φοβηθήκαμε και ξεκινήσαμε. Σίγουρα δεν ήταν κάτι εύκολο. Από την πρώτη όμως στιγμή που το κάναμε αυτό, τα έργα μίλησαν. Ομιλίες για το ελεύθερο λογισμικό, μαθήματα για τη χρήση αυτού, είτε στο Σύλλογο, είτε στο Πανεπιστήμιο Μακεδονίας, σε σχολεία και εκπαιδευτικά ιδρύματα. Οργανώσεις ε, Release Party GNU Linux Διανομών και Software Freedom Days. Ε, με αποκορύφωμα φυσικά σήμερα να έχουμε προσκεκλημένο μας, να μας έχει κάνει αυτή τη μεγάλη τιμή, να είναι μαζί μας ο Ρίτσαρ Στάλμαν, ο ιδρυτής και εμπνευστής του Ιδρύματος Ελεύθερου Λογισμικού. Μπορεί όλα να λειτουργούν σαν σύλλογος, παραμένουμε όμως μια μεγάλη παρέα με διαφορετικούς ανθρώπους ανάμεσά μας, με διαφορετικές ηλικίες και επαγγέλματα. Δεν είμαστε όλοι hackers ή επαγγελματίες της πληροφορικής. Αυτά τα άτομα ίσως είναι μετρημένα στα δάχτυλα του ενός σιωτιού. Έχουμε πλουραλισμό στους ανθρώπους, πράγμα που αποδεικνύει ότι όλοι μπορούν να ασχοληθούν και να προσφέρουν στο ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Θα χαρούμε πάρα πολύ να σας δούμε στα γραφεία του συλλόγου μας, να περάσετε, να γνωριστούμε και να μοιραστούμε τις απόψεις μας, τις ανησυχίες μας και τις εμπειρίες μας πάνω στο ελεύθερο λογισμικό. Ο Σύλλογος είναι ανοιχτό πάντοτε για όλους και όλοι είναι ευπρόσδεκτοι. Επίσης, θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω όλα τα μέλη του Συλλόγου, αλλά και τους ανθρώπους που προσπάθησαν για να έρθει αυτή η μέρα και να ολοκληρωθεί, για να φτάσουμε εδώ πέρα που είμαστε, τους αξίζει όλους ένα μεγάλο μπράβο. Και μια υπόσχεση προς όλους ότι τα καλύτερα τώρα έρχονται. Ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Good evening. I'm very happy to welcome today here uh, our distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Richard, Richard Stommon, uh, who will speak uh, about his work. Everybody of you knows, uh, I'm sure, his achievements. I would like to simply say that uh, we used in our uh, observatory uh, in the University of Thessaloniki the IMAX uh, editor in the late 80s. And at that time, I had no idea that I would meet here the author of this editor. Now I continue uh, in Greek. Σας ευχαριστώ που ήρθατε σήμερα εδώ. Δεν ξέρω πόσοι από εσάς έχουν ξανά επισκεφτεί το Ίδρυμά μας. Πάντως, τουλάχιστον σε αυτή την αίθουσα μπορείτε σε άλλες περιστάσεις να δείτε στην τεράστια οθόνη μας, ύψους 18 μέτρων, βλέπετε πως εγώ είμαι ένα 70. Τριδιάστατα τους δεινόσαυρους στο πλανητάριο 7-8 διαφορετικά προγράμματα και στον προσωμιωτή πάλι σε τρεις διαστάσεις διάφορες ταινίες δράσης. Καθώς και τα τρία εκθετήριά μας. Αυτά μια άλλη μέρα. Σήμερα ε, τελειώνω για να μπορέσει να έχει χρόνο ο διακεκριμένος καλεσμένος μας. Ευχαριστώ για σας. Now it's uh, time for our guest, uh, Mr. Stallman. Mr. Stallman, it's your turn. <laughs> wow. 
What is free software? Free software is software that respects the user's freedom. And the community, the social solidarity of the user's community. So it's free as in freedom. We're not talking about price. We don't mean gratis software. We mean freedom respecting software. It's clearer in Greek because you can say elethero and it doesn't mean zero price. So when you're speaking Greek, don't use the English word free. Say elethero. <clears throat> in English, I have to explain Think of free speech, not free beer. <coughs> to understand the correct meaning of the word free in the term free software. By the way, has the air conditioning been turned on? It doesn't feel that way. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> software which is not free, we call proprietary software, non-free software, user subjugating software. It's a system of digital colonization that keeps the users divided and helpless. You know, divide and rule is an old policy, but now it's being practiced through computer software. The users are divided because they are prohibited from redistributing copies, prohibited to share. <clears throat> They're helpless because they don't have the source code. So they can't change the program. They can't even tell what it really does. And often these programs have malicious features designed to mistreat the user. But what I've said is very general software that respects the user's freedom. What freedom is it? There are four essential freedoms that define free software. A program is free software if you, the user, have these four freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so that it does your computing the way you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help other people. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies of the program to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others when you wish. So if the program gives you these four freedoms, then it's free software because the social system of distributing and using that program is an ethical system, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, then the program is proprietary software, which means that it imposes an unethical social system on its users. Thus, if you want to live in freedom, you need to avoid proprietary software. Any proprietary program takes away your freedom. <clears throat> As you can see, this is not a technical question. It's not a question of how the code is written, or how the code works, or what job it does when it runs. It's a question of the social arrangements for using the code. So the same code can be distributed as free software or as proprietary software, and in some cases it's distributed in both ways in parallel. This is a social, ethical, and political question, not a technical question. The use of a free program in society is development. It's increased knowledge available to society for use. Free software is software that the citizens of any country or city can study, understand, maintain, adapt, and extend. Use of proprietary software is not development, it's dependence. To develop a free program, 
is a contribution to society. How much of a contribution, that depends on the details. But developing a proprietary program is not a contribution, it's a power grab. It's better to do nothing at all than develop a proprietary program because if you do nothing at all, then at least you're not doing harm. So, the goal of the free software movement is that all software be free so that all software users can be free. But why are these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom to, the freedom to help others, the freedom to redistribute exact copies when you wish, is essential on basic moral grounds. So you can live an upright, ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program that denies freedom too, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma at any moment. Whenever your friend says, that program seems useful, could I have a copy? In that moment, you will face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. <coughs> the other evil is to refuse your friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil, which is to give your friend a copy and violate the license of the program. What makes this the lesser evil? We can presume that your friend is a good friend and a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. By contrast, the developer of the proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community. So, if there's no way to avoid doing wrong to one or the other, you should do it to the developer. <clears throat> the developer deserves it. <laughs> However, being the lesser evil does not make it good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Because not even in cases like this one, where the agreement itself is evil, and keeping the agreement is worse than breaking it, still breaking it is not good. And if you give your, uh, if you have a portable tracking and surveillance device, please switch it off. They have already tracked you here. They know you're listening to me. So there's no need to keep sending out signals to inform them that you're still here. And if they want to hear my speech, they don't need to use your portable tracking and surveillance device in eavesdropping mode, where it transmits the conversations around you and doesn't ring or show you any sign that it's doing so, because a recording is being made and they'll be welcome to watch. <clears throat> Now, the reason, of course, that you can't control what these devices do is that they have proprietary software in them. <clears throat> and if you want to be sure they're not sending out signals saying where you are, you have to take the batteries out. It's the only way to reliably be sure. You see, with software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. <coughs> with free software, the users control the program, and nobody has power over anybody else. With proprietary software, the program controls the users, and the developer controls the program. So the developer has power over the users. So anyway, 
So even, even though breaking this agreement is the lesser evil, it's still not good. And if you give your friend a copy, what will she have? She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program. And that's a rather nasty thing. Almost as nasty as an authorized copy would be. <laughs> so, when you have fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? You should make sure you are never in this dilemma. But how? I know two ways. One is, don't have any friends. <laughs> the other is, don't use the program. Reject software that denies you freedom to. When someone offers me a program on the condition I not share it with you, I say, my conscience does not allow me to accept that condition, so take your evil software out of here. And that's what you should say. Reject software that forbids sharing. And reject also the propaganda terms that the proprietary developers use to demonize cooperation. For instance, terms like pirate, when they call people who share pirates, what are they really saying? They are saying that helping other people is the moral equivalent of attacking from ships. And morally speaking, nothing could be more false than that. So they shouldn't be called by the same name. Refuse to call these people pirates refuse to describe sharing as piracy. When people ask me what I think of piracy, I say, attacking from ships is very bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to help others, the freedom <coughs> to redistribute exact copies to others when you wish. And I should point out that each of these four freedoms is literally the freedom to do a certain thing if and when you wish. You're never required to do so. You don't have to share a copy with everybody who asks. The point is you should be free to do so when you wish. So that's the reason for freedom too, the freedom to redistribute exact copies, essential on basic moral grounds. But freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason. So you can control your computing. There are proprietary programs whose licenses <coughs> restrict even the use of authorized copies. For instance, there is a program for managing a website whose license forbids using the program to publish anything that criticizes the developer. In this case, proprietary software literally takes away your freedom of speech. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what can I say? If you're not even allowed to use your copy as you like, then you don't control your computing. Your control has been taken away through the license of that software. So freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to either do or not do whatever the code is set up to do. Which means the developer still controls what you can do and what you can't do. Not through the license, but instead through the code of the program. In order to control your own computing, you need, therefore, freedom one. The freedom to study the source code and change it to make the program do what you wish. This way, you decide instead of letting the developer impose his decisions on you. If you don't have freedom one, you can't even tell what the program is doing. 
And many of these programs have malicious features designed not to serve the user, but instead to spy on the user, restrict the user. There are even back doors to attack the user. And this is not something rare that would happen once in a rare while when you're unlucky. This, these malicious features are found in very common proprietary software. One proprietary program you may have heard of that has all of these three kinds of malicious feature is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> People have found spy features that send messages reporting on the use of the machine. Of course, the digital handcuffs designed to restrict what the users do with the files in their own computers, those are visible. Because when the software says, you are not permitted to do that in your own computer, of course the users see that they're not being permitted. But the back doors that give Microsoft the ability to give commands to someone else's computer, those are not visible. People had to study cleverly to discover this. But Microsoft has a backdoor in Windows that it can use to forcibly install changes in software. Any change in any software in the machine, Microsoft can install. Without asking permission of the nominal owner of the computer. I say nominal owner because when Microsoft has Windows running in that computer, Microsoft has owned that computer. Whatever malicious feature Windows does not have today, it might have, Microsoft might put in tomorrow. We know that the security of Windows is pretty bad. But the security of Windows against Microsoft is not just bad, it's zero. But the Macintosh is malicious too. It has digital handcuffs. Digital handcuffs are also known as DRM or Digital Restrictions Management. And in addition, Apple has provided optional upgrades, which practically speaking, the users were compelled to install. The newer Apple products, such as the iGrown and the iBad, <coughs> are nastier. They have backdoors. And for instance, Apple has gone so far as to impose its control over what applications users can install. They can only install the applications that Apple approves of. And not only that, with, its, with a back door, Apple can deinstall an application. If Apple approved an application a month ago, and today Apple decides it's not approved anymore, Apple can send messages to deinstall that application from iGrowns and iBads. <clears throat> so, these are thoroughly malicious products. And then there's the Adobe Flash Player. The Adobe Flash Player has a malicious surveillance feature, which is called Super Cookies. They are like the cookies in a browser except that browsers give users some control over when they're permitted, and the Adobe Flash Player does not give users control. Each sites can even detect that the same person is talking to both sites by communicating through the Flash Player. So, having that program in your computer makes you vulnerable. You should definitely not, not have that. <clears throat> In addition, it has digital handcuffs. And then there's the Amazon Swindle. That's not the official name. Amazon calls it the Kindle. 
this is an ebook reader. What is an ebook? Strictly speaking, an ebook is a book in digital form. There's nothing particularly bad about.